Uh, with that, Ashi, just uh, could you kind of give a little background to yourself, um, education, uh, just life accomplishments in general, and uh, what you're about? Yeah, sure. Uh, Max, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's great to, to be here. Um, so my name is Ashi Bachu, founder and CEO of Empty Squared Health. Um, my background is in uh, healthcare administration, so I've been in the finance, operations, and strategy part of healthcare uh, for the better part of uh, about 10, 11 years now. Um, and so I started my career, um, you know, getting a bachelor's degree at Case when I graduated in 2011 uh, in medical anthropology. Uh, really enjoyed medicine, the healthcare space, and was really emerging, trying to figure out where I saw myself. Uh, and so uh, I was at Case, uh, you know, got, a, got that degree and then went on and did an experiential actually fellowship through Case, where I studied medical tourism. Um, and then I went to worked a little bit in pharma to understand, you know, the business side of healthcare. So I was over with Genentech for a bit um, and then realized pharma wasn't quite for me. Um, and so I decided to be a little bit closer to the provider side of healthcare. And I hopped on over to graduate school. I was at Columbia and got my master's um, in healthcare administration. Um, so I was there at Columbia, really got interested in provider and healthcare systems. Um, did a fellowship with Columbia through their um, medical center where I was with the departments of dermatology and internal medicine, uh, really focused into um, finance and strategy when I was with both those departments. Moved eventually out west um, with my uh, then girlfriend, now wife, um, Divya, who started her PhD um, over at Berkeley. Um, and when we moved out west, I um, decided to work with UCSF, which is a major health system out in the Bay Area. Um, and so with them, I started with the Department of Psychiatry, um, where I had a team of 14 people running clinical operations, um, got really steeped um, in practice ops, really, you know, got to cut my teeth, particularly as we were uh, with uh, psychiatry, moving them from a paper-based system over to a fully uh, electronic medical record epic, um, and really enjoyed that experience of kind of understanding the nuts and bolts of how healthcare operations works at a very atomic level. Um, and then kind of taking roles and moving them over um, from a paper-based system, very manual system into a fully electronic uh, medical record. So really enjoy that experience. Um, you know, had some really great uh, gains. We were able to boost revenue by about 50, 60%, um, as well as double um, outpatient volume, which is tremendous. Um, and then, you know, once I kind of felt like I had gotten my fill um, in direct practice ops and psychiatry, I then decided I was going to kind of move a little bit more um, into the startup space. Um, so I worked with a, a telepsychiatry company as a fractional CFO, as well as a few other consulting gigs I was looking at. Um, and then really this idea of MC Squared Health kind of was germinating at the time through when I was leaving UCSF. And I ultimately decided I really needed to grab that by the reins. Um, and I, I hopped into doing uh, MC Squared Health full time. Um, and so, you know, since being full-time, we've been able to launch an MVP, get some good like early traction, um, and really understand what we want to do with future iterations of the product, speak with a lot of VCs who are very interested, um, and you know, we're really um, eager and excited to kind of keep pushing this idea forward. So it's, 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 a, it's a great time for us. Um, we're relatively early in the startup journey, um, but you know, being steeped in um, healthcare, um, kind of the exploration and the, the possibilities of being in startups in this space is, is really exciting. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, could you, and you talk about your startup journey a little bit there, but could you maybe go into a little bit more about MC Squared Health, like the product market fit, um, as well as just, you know, the, the company in general and what you saw there? Um, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I was with the UCSF Psychiatry, um, what I saw was that there was a substantial gap um, that is between um, when a patient is receiving a bill from a provider and uh, the patient's ability to understand what exactly you know, is being paid by their insurance, what the patient owes, and then being able to ultimately pay that full balance. I mean, I saw that very much on the front lines when patients would come into my office and be trying to figure out their bill um, or say that they're having a challenge and trying to understand what are their different payment options. Um, and so that became like a real pain point that was very obvious. Um, and so what I did is I, um, you know, did some research and then ultimately, you know, uh, came up with this idea for MC Squared Health. 
And really um, this MVP that we had launched is in this kind of product market space of like providing direct services to patients as customers. Um, and you know, that provided some great insights and we were able to get some customers on, generate some initial revenue and traction and really kind of highlighted this bigger product market fit issue that we were kind of curious about, which is that um, billing in healthcare is extremely complicated for patients. Mm -hmm. uh, patients don't interact with the health system very often. And when they do, they're physically, emotionally, financially vulnerable. And so we thought that there was a real opportunity here to provide a service that could actually address some of the need on the patient side. And on the provider side, you know, 80% of what um, patients are billed is often not collected. Uh, so we, and we see providers ranking, um, you know, revenue cycle management on patient collections as the number one issue. Then it's 73% of patients, 73% uh, of providers, sorry, have ranked that um, patient collections is their biggest pain point on the revenue cycle side. And we think that there is a lack of compelling kind of solutions in the space. And so that's part of the reason why we think that um, us entering in and providing um, you know, the value that we're looking to do with the software solution is something that, um, you know, we can really uh, kind of drive and, and be an effective player in this market. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and for me, like as an up and coming, like a uh, college student uh, into adulthood, uh, the healthcare system is something that really scares me. Like, I just, I feel like I have no grasp on it at all. <laughs> so could you kind of uh, maybe describe to you what you've seen as some of like the most complex systems with in healthcare, and that makes it difficult for people like me to understand um, when I'm going through the system. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's a great question. Uh, healthcare is complicated, um, and I think that anybody who is in there, uh, you know, anybody after the age of 26, for the most part, when you're you know off your uh, parents' insurance, are is going to feel the sting of needing to like understand how to navigate this incredibly complex system. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, there's a few factors that make it really complex. Um, the first is that, you know, you have in the U.S. something that's relatively less common, which is a third party payer system, which means that um, the bulk of payments for healthcare services are coming from an employer or from a government insurance, typically to an insurance company. Um, and so you have to be employed to have access to insurance to, and for the majority of Americans are employed to get access to insurance. And so that's a very confusing system because where paperwork is going, who's paying what can be very confusing. Um, the other thing that's very challenging with healthcare is that um, when you're sick, you're having to go to your provider to get guidance on what to do next. It's not something that can so easily be you know, consumer or patient driven where you know exactly what you need to do, but you're looking through the eyes of somebody else to understand um, what is it that you need to do next? What is the treatment to arrive at the cure for the uh, condition that you have? And so that's very, that's very complicated, especially when you're physically, emotionally compromised uh, as a patient. Um, and you know, the, the third thing is that um, the incentive models are very, challenging in healthcare. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of um, kind of cost insulation is what it's called. So that, which is that like patients oftentimes don't have the ability to see what exactly it is they're paying for. So in a traditional model um, of buying a service, you'd be able to see how much something costs. You'd be able to understand your need for that and you'd spend the money to get it. In healthcare, it doesn't quite work that way because you don't know the extent of the services, nor do you know how much something is going to cost from the initial start. You don't know how much your insurance is going to pay for it. And that is very intimidating. Uh, it's hard to engage with something when you don't know um, the full extent to which it's going to work for you or how much it's going to cost. Um, and a lot of the more um, you know, recent healthcare work has been around improving um, availability of information and also um, availability of quality and driving up quality um, in care uh, to make it a little bit more of a consumer friendly experience, but there are still obvious hurdles and challenges. I mean, these are very complex systems that, that can't really change overnight. So off of that, you know, talking about provider billing, um, and this is obviously like a main point of MC Squared Health and what your business is doing. Could you kind of speak to what MC Squared Health is, is prepared to do with provider billing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so MC Squared Health, what we're looking to do 
is provide a really simple platform where a provider can enter their billing information that would be going from their health system to the patient and for the patient on their end to have uh, omni-channel payments on so being able to engage the patient to make a payment and simplify that process so that they're able to easily understand you know what it is that they're paying for and then go ahead and transact that payment from make that payment from their end and you know if a patient has a challenging time with a payment being able to easily set up different financing options like payment plans or tapping to benefits and services that these healthcare providers often give. Um, you know, our MVP, just to kind of go one level deeper, our MVP was looking at um, utilization of uh, basically a benefit that was available under the Affordable Care Act, but has been uh, pretty under tapped. And so we just said, we're going to develop this one thing. We're going to develop this one service that all nonprofit hospitals in the U.S. have. You know, 80, per, 80 plus percent of hospitals in the U.S. are nonprofits. So said, we're going to develop this service and we're going to launch it on, on the website and make it easy for patients to use and see if that allows people to engage with it. And, you know, we found that people are willing to use these systems that otherwise they wouldn't have even known about. Um, because ultimately the pain point is the same. They, they are looking for ways to make bills more payable within their budgets. And so any step that we can make in terms of what we're doing with the product to make um, bills understandable or easier to pay or more convenient ultimately moves the needle in a positive direction in terms of providers being able to be reimbursed for money that they might otherwise have not been able to capture um, because you know medical costs are high and confusing. And so we're, we're trying to um, really make a positive impact in that space. And could you maybe you're just talking about your minimal viable product, your MVP. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? You know what you've found so far, and then in the future, like what you're hoping to achieve with this? Yeah, absolutely. So the MVP um, took this idea of um, discounting and payment plans, and so what we did is we um, took we looked at a bunch of hospitals. We took what their core elements were, what were the common denominator factors, and we said we're going to boil this down into a process that's automated for a patient to come in, you know, upload their medical bill and put some information, um, input like necessary, you know, tax information that they have. And then for us to be able to coordinate that directly with the health system um, to set up payment plans and, you know, discounts that a patient might be eligible for, and then get the patient an updated bill. And so, you know, as I mentioned, this is, uh, a lot of this is covered under the Affordable Care Act in terms of uh, policies and uh, processes that hospitals are required to provide. But the reason why we thought an MVP in the space would be unique was because we found that the majority of hospitals that they're required to traditionally do this on paper and are asking patients to either fax an information or to mail an information. And the information that hospitals are asking for is like, often poorly worded on the applications or it's not clear what are the follow-up steps? So we said, hey, you know, we can apply our expertise in this space um, and simplify this process for the patient. We can make this as easy as possible for the patients to engage with when they have a high bill. And let's put it out there and see if we have any bites. And, you know, clearly there's interest from patients. I mean, we were able to um, discount and finance over $125,000 in medical bills. Um, and we launched in September of 2019. Um, and so that's kind of like what we've done to this point. Um, it's interesting now with COVID, there's a variety of factors that are happening um, in terms of like billing operations um, and, you know, patients are receiving medical bills. Um, and so we've definitely noticed that there's been an interesting impact and, and a different kind of outreach that we've seen from potential customers uh, in the, within the past two or three months. So that's kind of like past to kind of present. And then in future, um, what we're looking to do is, is we're trying to take the core elements that we have in this MVP, and we're really gonna integrate them into our um, B2B product that we're working on. Because ultimately, um, these are optimizations for services that providers typically render through people or through paper-based applications. And we've built uh, like automation and we've built you know, technological efficiencies around it. So we're gonna take this and move this into our new um, B2B product. And that B2B product has, that we're developing right now is going to be what we then, um, you know, contract with providers and get services through. So I think it's best said through like an example. Um, imagine like Max, you're you know running a private practice clinic, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you're seeing your patients and you're manually billing them, meaning 
um, you're literally handwriting, which some providers are still doing, or you're typing it into like a Word document statement about how much a patient owes. You're taking it, you're sticking it in an envelope, putting it in the mail, and then your patients are, you know, paying that bill um, through the mail, and then you're receiving it on your private practice end, and you're depositing it to the bank. Now, sure, that can work for some amount of time, but you know, as you scale or as your billing gets more complicated, there's a really low ceiling um, that you start hitting up against. And so what, you know, we would want you to do is to use our platform, right? So you come on, you submit your bill through our platform, the patient receives it on their end, and they then, you know, pay the bill uh, directly through the platform and you receive the payment on your end. So simple automated solution. And you know, if a patient said, you know, hey, Max billed me for, you know, $5,000, I can't pay that. Um, Through the same platform, they'd be able to say, hey, you know, I want to do this in terms of, you know, a six month payment plan, and be able to structure that through the website. And then we we would coordinate that with you, let you know that this payment plan has been set up, Max, and that um, the patient is then um, paying for that, uh, according to that payment plan. Um, So they're continuously engaged. Um, and you're not potentially as the private practice provider, maybe like sending a bill to a patient, they're balking at the bill, getting really confused and completely disengaging. We think that that's kind of the cycle where we really have to, to step in and provide a meaningful solution um, because in the absence of that, we're, we're losing patients. So that's how we're kind of looking to move the MVP into um, kind of our next uh, stage of business. No, it's interesting. Just like going off that, and you were uh, generous enough to show me your pitch deck a little bit, and we're talking, and you're exactly talking about a diagram on there where it's got two circles, one that says patient, one that says MC squared health, um, and then just as you're saying, like all everything is falling on the patient on this one circle, right? And the other circle, everything is then falling on MC squared health, where you're able to kind of be the middleman of sorts, right, and be able to leave all that pressure off the patient. That's exactly right. I mean if you can imagine like a traditional hospital episode, and, and we saw this with one of our customers, I mean, like sufficiently um, abstracted and, and not giving any, um, you know, personal health information. Um, but we, you know, saw a patient who came in, she had a hospital bill from, uh, you know, being hospitalized. But since she was came through the emergency room, she also had the ambulance bill that came with the hospital bill. She also then had the uh, radiology bill. She had an anesthesiologist who saw her while she was in the hospital. So that was a different bill. Um, and then when she was discharged, she also had a um, outpatient visit. And just before she had the outpatient visit, all of these four or five other bills started coming in. And then she panicked and she said, well, I don't know if I can go see this outpatient provider. So we had a direct example where, you know, a patient who had, you know, one episode of care received multiple bills um, and then also uh, received this, um, you know, received a bill, the bills right at the time where it might have actually led her to disengaging with care altogether and doing her follow-up outpatient visit. And that outpatient visit is to reduce the risk of her getting potentially hospitalized again, right? And so these are very real-world examples um, that we see and the ways in which, like, finances can drive uh, patient decision making, both around like being able to pay bills, but also in in their willingness to engage with health systems. And so what we're trying to do is create a solution where, um, you know, we're of course partnering with providers. So like a patient can pay it simply through the portal, but we also want to give patients the ability if they want to use this to pay other medical bills that they can easily do so. Um, And so we're assessing, you know, payment processing options to be able to do that really effectively. And in an ideal scenario, like, you know, you can come just through MC squared health and pay all of your medical bills. Uh, Just, just to pause on one thing and and pivot, because I think this is a fascinating subject. We've noticed that, you know, large health systems or other folks who have payment portals online, are structured in such a way that it's very narrow, right? They, so if I'm, um, let's say if I'm Cleveland Clinic um, and I'm using, I believe Cleveland Clinic is on Epic, but please don't quote me on that. Um, let's say I'm using Epic. Epic has a system called MyChart um, and MyChart does everything under the sun, including where patients pay their bills. But engagement rates for logging into Epic MyChart is um, 6% of users log into Epic two or more times. So if you have an online solution for bill pay, but nobody's going to do it, um, that doesn't quite address the pain point. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how we can kind of enter into this space. Um, And it's clearly a pain point 
that, that hasn't fully been solved. Um, and, and we think that uh, providers are too much using technology to go um, accelerate what they're already doing, which is um, they're trying to go directly to patients through their own individual pathway, but they're not really centering the experience around the patient, which is, you know, allowing the patient to pay all of their bills through one place. And, and we think that we can do that in a way that there isn't currently a solution on the market for. Right. Um, and before I ask my next question, yeah, there's some questions popping up in the chat now, but I, once again, I encourage you, everyone in the, in the discussion here, to, I know it's a little weird, but try to, if you hover your mouse to the bottom of the screen, there's a chat button that you just hit that and then you can type your message. Um, and we'll be able to see and ask that question in a little bit. Um, so off that, Ashi, like, could we talk um, a little bit about, you know, what, <clears throat> so that, that was interesting, talking about Epic, you know, that's, it's, that seems like we're talking about intimidating systems here, whether it's healthcare, Epic is such an intimidating system, 6% of users. Um, so going to your, your kind of, uh, your software you're going to continue to create, um, you know, you really want to start low to high, right? So you're going to start like smaller hospitals, right? And going into a larger hospital that eventually you will be able to take X amount of beds, right? Or whatnot. Um, so right now, what does that look like? What stage are you in? Are you taking on like smaller hospitals? Um, are you starting to move to middle hospitals? And, and when do you think you'll get to those larger hospitals that you'll be able to um, be able to take that workload in for your website and company? Yeah, I definitely appreciate you. I mean, you looked at the pitch deck and that's a great question from it. Um, <coughs> what I would say is that, <coughs> sorry, what I would say is that we're early on, right? So we're doing our angel raise for the B2B side. Ooh, what I really got to go through. One second. I think it went down the wrong pipe there. Anyways, um, we had, um, we're putting together our angel raise to be able to go after like the small private practice providers to start with. So what we want to do is common with like startups at our stage is that we want to get as close to the um, patient provider experience as possible using the service. Understand, you know, what are the crucial features? What are the expected features? What are the delightful features, you know? Um, and kind of understand, you know, how we're doing at that very atomic level. Um, so I would say like, we're going after um, small practices on the magnitude of maybe one to two offices, um, you know, five or so, five to 10 providers to start with. Um, and these are practices that by and large are using very manual systems in which they're processing um, bills and statements and that sort of thing. And what we're then going to look towards doing once we have kind of that crucial software piece in play um, is we're going to think more and more around how do we further integrate with electronic healthcare records. So moving up kind of that value chain is going to necess necessitate having like tech, uh, technological adapters and like APIs and that sort of thing where we're able to um, more easily receive the information from like medium sized um, healthcare practices, being able to receive that information through um, their medical record and then being able to um, port that into our system so that we can um, coordinate billing out with patients and receiving payments. So that's mm -hmm. kind of like the um, short-term vision to medium-term vision. Um, in terms of like what we're expecting, we're, we're ex uh, expecting to uh, put together this initial uh, B2B platform um, by about September of this year. Um, and we're hoping to close two contracts uh, with small practices by the end of this year. Um, with this angel race and kind of what we have in mind. Great. And with that, you know, where is your competition stand? I know you've got a couple, and let's not talk about the epics of the world. Let's, let's focus more on people that are really providing what you want to provide. Um, where are they at? And, you know, where do you see your advantages over their business? Yeah, great question. So I think that um, the systems that currently exist, you know, uh, you could definitely say um, the incumbent systems like the epics or even, you know, um, just hospital billing operations. Um, you could say it's kind of like the baseline, not necessarily a competitor, but, but like just what the baseline is doing. Um, they exist. Um, there's also the um, folks who are, you know, focusing just on patient collections at large enterprise levels. Um, so some groups that have come up are like Simply, for example. Um, recently, they were acquired by the Flywire. Um, there's another group in Southern California, uh, Cedar. Um, 
And so what we see with these different competitors is that they've locked really into a product where it accelerates the one-to-one -one relationship between a um, provider and a patient who's receiving the bill, and they're optimizing the speed of that transaction. Mm -hmm. And we think that that is valuable. Um, but we think that there's potentially more that you can do in this space by centering the patient, because ultimately these solutions that are out there are looking at taking what the provider does, and accelerating the effectiveness of that. We think that, that that is absolutely one dimension that you need to compete on, but also because patients receive bills from a variety of different places, the goal should be to center the patient and then out of that experience that the patient's having, they'll be able to pay all of those bills more effectively rather than, um, you know, let's say uh, a patient has a bill that they're receiving from an incumbent system, a bill that they're receiving from Simply, and a bill that they're receiving from Cedar. They're still having to interact with those three different bill pay systems. And you don't want to be caught in the bottom of that pecking order uh, of, um, you know, where you're having to pay those bills through. So we think that by centering the patient, you actually unlock a lot more future potential for what you could do in this uh, patient bill pay space. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's great. That's a really robust, I think, uh, background of everything. Um, do you mind if we get into some, I guess we, you've wrapped up some fans here. Do you mind if we get into some fan questions we could call? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right, great. Um, so, fans. Yeah, so I want to go into, I think, Sarah's first. And Sarah, if, you would, if you're on and you can hear me, if you'd like to actually just ask this directly to Ashley, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Um, so the question was curious to know what kind of support or probably pressure you're seeing from the health systems and or insurers regarding this interface, since essentially you're taking their primary client and directing them to you instead. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I would take a step back and say that uh, health systems are primarily, health systems and providers are primarily the point of contact for us. Um, so less on the insurance side, definitely what we're seeing is that the health systems have a high degree of variation in terms of like uh, when they bill patients, how patients are able to pay, how effectively patients are able to pay. Um, and we're seeing that um, using kind of a one size fits all way of like billing patients, which is what health systems uh, tend to do, uh, has limited results. You know, for example, uh, Gen X versus a millennial versus a boomer type population. These are simplifications I know, um, but they have different ways of uh, preferred payment methods. And so when you're using a one size fits all approach, there's limited um, success that you can get. Um, and so health systems are, are, in one way struggling, they're trying to find approaches, solutions to be able to um, collect more of this money that they're billing out to patients. Um, the downside risk of it is like if they can't collect that money, they're either you know, writing it off and just saying we give up on collecting this altogether or they're sending it out to collections, um, which can have any number of downstream you know, effects on health systems, either you know, if you have a collections group that's, you know, uh, inappropriately following up on patient, you could have a damaging reputational effect to the health system. Um, you could lead to, you know, patients telling their friends and family not to go to this provider because they build them inappropriately, any number of things. So health systems by and large are looking for ways and partners where they can effectively collect on this money that they owe. And we believe we can be a partner with them so long as we are, you know, abiding by the appropriate, um, methods for doing business, for example, uh, being mindful, HIPAA compliant, um, being HIPAA secured, um, you know, forming contracts with them um, that are, you know, we're housing the information appropriately from our end, um, and then generating results. I mean, at the end of the day, this is such an untapped area where, undertapped area, I should say, where um, it's very hard for providers to collect from patients, it's a much smaller revenue pot than say insurance collections. And um, the number of patients that uh, have increasing uh, deductibles and high deductible health plans is accelerating. And so providers are trying to find ways that they can find strategic partners to help them take some of this load um, so that they can focus on, you know, what the provider uh, hospital side tends to be best at, which is rendering direct uh, patient care, as well as uh, probably focusing on the uh, insurance billing side of the equation. 
Thank you, Asha. Does that answer everything, Sarah, for you? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, I think next I'm going to go to uh, Bob. Bob Twitter had more of a comment. He said, uh, UI, UX, user interface, user experience is not the best on systems for the patient. Bob, could you maybe explain that a little bit more? Go into depth with that. Sure, yeah. So <clears throat> I've, I've logged into UH um, and um, uh, the clinic uh, elements. And I mean, they're okay, but not what I would consider like you know, 2020, 2019, maybe 2005 <laughs> ability. I mean, they're kind of clunky. Um, they're, they're not the best experience. And the thing is, hopefully, if you don't need it a lot, you're not going in there often anyways. Uh, but I did not realize, what did you say, 6% was the, um, the usage rate? Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize it was that dismal. But, but one thing, during this whole COVID stuff, um, I know a couple of people who work at these um, different um, hospitals. They've been trying forever to get people to utilize um, telemedicine and very, very low uptick. Now they said, we're done. It's, it's been accepted and this has been super, super helpful for us um, that the acceptance rate's gone up. So, but yeah, again, the UI UX I think is just, just rough. I, they're not like looking at the customer, they're looking at what's easy for them. Yeah, I mean, just, just to kind of piggyback on that comment, I think you're exactly right on both counts, which is that um, UI UX on these systems is, um, is, n is 2005, I think is a great way to frame it. <laughs> it, it it's a little bit behind the times. Um, and I think that uh, you're absolutely right that um, there's a boom that's kind of happened um, in the telehealth space. Um, in, in terms of increased adoption, I know that uh, kind of working from the telehealth back to the UI UX part, um, telehealth has been kind of on the docket for um, federal legislators uh, to review. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of, let's say trepidation, maybe it's a bit of a strong term um, for, uh, you know, private insurance, you know, your blues, your Cygnas, Anthems, whatnot, um, to uh, accept reimbursement, full reimbursement and, and uh, really form robust contracts, broad contracts around uh, telehealth services. I think that that is kind of shifted now um, or that will start to shift uh, if the federal government, you know, starts to set up provisions where Medicare will reimburse. I think that would be um, kind of the tipping point uh, for telehealth. Um, now in terms of the UI UX uh, side of the equation, yeah, I think that uh, there's absolutely a role that um, technology, modern, uh, you know, tech companies can play in this space. Because uh, when you look at the psychology of the user, um, it's very complicated in terms of how they're navigating everything on their computer. There's lots of distractions, lots of things going on. Um, and then you add on the complexity of being ill, um, add in the complexity of um, not understanding your medical bill or what your insurance has to pay. So many patients just disengage from paying a bill because they say, what do I have my insurance for? If they're not paying for this, I shouldn't have to pay anything without fully understanding, you know, that there's a copay, a coinsurance deductible, any number of patient liabilities that can come into effect that they're still responsible for. So I think that the ability to use technology to really effectively communicate that to a patient to secure payment um, and then also give them an experience where they're willing to keep coming back. And I think the keep coming back effect is, you know, related to that 6% uh, engagement figure with the Epic My Chart. Um, so we think that there's really something there. Um, and like kind of the one thing I guess that can tie kind of the, the telehealth to the patient billing side. Um, with COVID, we think that there's a really interesting um, effect here, I should say, where, uh, you know, patients are ill um, and they need to be seen and they're looking for services and, you know, using the space of, you know, psychiatry, behavioral health, um, the effects of social isolation are, are documented. And so this is a particularly challenging time for telehealth and the behavioral health space. Um, and so if you can't, you know, collect a patient payment directly from swiping a credit card, which is common for a lot of psychiatric practices, how are you collecting patient payments? Um, and so we're seeing that, you know, again, through the end of this year, that there's going to be probably an opportunity for us in that space to be um, a solution that kind of couples can couple with telehealth where, you know, sure, you're having your telehealth appointment. Uh, and then also, you know, you'll receive, you know, a bill through your computer uh, to be able to pay it easily through a service such as ours. So 
we're, we're mindful that um, kind of the landscape of healthcare is shifting and, and we think that um, there are opportunities, you know, in the telespace for us um, is, and, you know, we're excited to see that telehealth utilization is also expanding. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and now I'm going to get to another message. This is uh, sent by Craig. Um, he said, what is the role of a patient advocate? And will we see this uh, more prevalent moving forward? And yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so patient advocates, um, we can think of them as uh, compassionate, dedicated firms, individuals that are working with and behalf of the patient in order for the patient to receive um, an, a more optimal outcome than if the patient was uh, trying to engage and take on the health system on their own. So an example of that would be, you know, if you are, um, if you're physically impacted, um, emotionally, mentally impacted, right, and you're, you know, receiving care, um, and you're trying to uh, navigate a complex, um, you know, social services system or a complex, you know, patient billing system or something like that, or understand, you know, why your insurance is not paying your bill. Um, there's any number of roles that a, a broad category, like a healthcare advocate could come in and kind of help out. Um, we definitely like in this MVP service uh, that we had from support health, like we fell very much under that category of uh, a healthcare advocate where we're effectively um, reaching out um, with patients on their behalf with, you know, releases of information, authorizations to speak on their behalf to help them coordinate these bills. Um, so we like wore that hat for the MVP in the absence of having uh, formal contracts uh, with a lot of the providers that we were working with in the initial model of this service. And so, um, you know, advocates are very important um, and they exist both within the health system as well as outside of, you know, within the health system, meaning within the provider system, they could have, you know, social workers can be considered healthcare advocates, right? They're working on patients' behalf um, in a lot of ways. Um, or you could have folks who are outside of, you know, the healthcare system, you know, like a more private, you know, contracted group, or, you know, even a family member could be a healthcare advocate. So this is a pretty broad definition, just simply this idea of, of, of helping the patient through uh, navigating the complexities of the healthcare system. Uh, in terms of like expanding the number of healthcare advocates um, and like what the future of that holds, uh, it's a fascinating question. I think that hopefully there's going to be a simplification of the healthcare system as it becomes increasingly like patient centric, consumer centric. I think that's really important. Uh, so hopefully the need for healthcare advocates decrease, but at the same time, um, you know, healthcare advocates are really important. Uh, so there's always going to be some level of confusion or if the healthcare system shifts, maybe there's something else that comes up that we couldn't foresee from here that could be uh, challenging and needs to be better understood. And so there's, there's always going to be a role for healthcare advocates. Uh, one thing that I've seen that's been interesting is kind of this movement towards um, some technology companies basically saying like, hey, this is a high frequency pathway with something that we can kind of protocolize and create a uh, service around. So there's groups in California that do um, uh, like Medi-Cal enrollment, for example. Medi-Cal is um, our state version of Medicaid. Um, so they'll do Medi-Cal enrollment where they can very easily figure out, you know, who are potential candidates um, for Medi-Cal through whatever sourcing mechanisms that they have, and then be able to really easily using an online, you know, technology, um, kind of automate and scale the ability to um, get different patients engaged in their system and then kind of have them enrolled. So that's like a different kind of healthcare advocacy service that might otherwise in a more, you know, traditional sense or, you know, uh, I should say uh, more manual sense, maybe 20 years ago have been done by somebody with a pen and a sheet of paper and a, and a piece of phone that they're calling from a hospital unit from. So it's kind of interesting to see these sh uh, services shift um, around uh, where they can, so moving some of these healthcare advocacy services online and, and that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, so with that, we'll uh, we'll move a little bit into talking about uh, COVID nineteen. I know you touched on it, Ashi, um, but Aditi has a comment. She in asks, um, what kind of adaptations do you think will be made with payment systems in light of COVID nineteen? Um, especially, you know, talking about unemployment. Uh, leading to a loss of health insurance for American citizens. Yeah, um, so COVID-19 is uh, 
I think the, the effects of COVID-19 on the billing side of the equation are yet to fully be understood. So I have to, I have to really uh, underscore that. Um, I, if I was to hypothesize kind of what's going to happen um, is that number one, based on what we're currently doing in the healthcare system, which is really focusing on the front end of care, taking care of patients, you know, uh, managing disease burden viral loads with like public health interventions, but then also when patients are getting sick and in the hospital, that we are uh, making sure that there's sufficient infrastructure there to be able to service them. Um, that's beds, tents, providers, ventilators, any number of necessary, um, uh, uh, you know, amenities that are required to be able to treat patients. Having those available is kind of where the focus is now. There's a decreasing um, emphasis on, you know, or decreased emphasis on a lot of the back end billing stuff. It's kind of like a, we'll figure that out a little bit when we get there. Um, we're still trying to figure out, you know, what are the billing systems around, um, you know, what insurance will and will not pay for. There's a lot of back and forth between, you know, uh, approved and denied claims, especially because, uh, you know, insurance billing is very complicated within the American healthcare system. And when you put a sudden change like this um, into the system, it's very hard for the system to suddenly switch and adapt. So, you know, payers, providers are doing the best they can, but there's probably a lot of claims that are backlog right now, or a lot of claims that are kind of caught between insurance companies and healthcare providers. And when that happens, there's kind of this bolus that forms, like this bald kind of mass um, that will, you know, process over time and will eventually come out the other side. Coming out the other side and oft oftentimes means that there will be balances that do come down to patients um, that they'll owe. So, for example, uh, deductibles. You know, if there's you know, a million claims, I'm making up a number, a million claims typically processed um, and you know, 800,000 of them typically come out and are paid by patients. Now we might be looking at a scenario where like only 200,000 claims are actually coming out and the remaining $800,000 are caught, 800,000 claims are caught in kind of this log between the provider and patient, uh, provider and, and uh, insurance company. And so as a result of that, it might be some time before it actually flows through and comes out to the patient side to, to pay. Now there's also, so there's the bolus effect that's, that's happening. There's also the effect of, um, you know, what is and is not um, billable to a patient. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, information coming down from the federal government can oftentimes be um, confusing or can be um, stated one way and then, um, you know, implemented or acted on in a different way. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of turbulence in how the information is being presented there. But by and large, um, what we're seeing is that um, state by state, uh, that the insurance companies are saying that they will pay for costs related to uh, COVID testing as a minimum, and in some cases, some forms of COVID treatment. Now that's wonderful, but the challenge here is that um, in addition to going in for healthcare service, there's a number of charges that accumulate. So for example, if I'm hospitalized, um, for three days with a COVID related illness. Um, there can be observation fees, there can be admission fees, there can be testing fees, there can be, you know, um, maybe I'm having a MRI done to check out my you know, lungs and see how my lungs are doing. Um, and so which of those codes necessarily fall under this distinction of, you know, being covered um, due to COVID testing is, is challenging and, and variable from state to state. And if your insurance company is, is more willing to pay for some of those um, fees and those costs, that's wonderful. Um, that becomes potentially less that comes to the patient. Um, but still, there's a high degree of variability from policy to policy, state to state. Um, and there's no real um, silver bullet answer to how much you know, financial liability our patient's going to have for COVID treatment. Um, so it, it's very complicated. I think that COVID is kind of pointed out a lot of the um, kind of fissures that exist within our healthcare system in terms of the complexity have really amplified some of those and um, unfortunately are putting uh, additional strains on patients who have these bills that they have to pay. Right, it's really intensifying in the healthcare system. I mean, that makes sense, but I mean, every, every sector you're seeing some kind of intensification, I guess, if that's even a word, but <laughs> you're seeing some kind of uh, magnification on that system. Right, exactly right. Um, 
So I want to go to David Jargello now, uh, an alumnus uh, K thirty two. Uh, thank you for your, uh, for sharing up and as well as your comments. So he talks a little bit more about you know we have this very old medical payment system and it's great. We have people like Ashi, you know, really working on trying to improve these things, um, and you you end up with five bills uh, with one trip to the hospital instead of just one. So he's and this is something you know that was enlightening for me when we first talked Ashi. But he's asking you know they what happens, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, right? But what happens with these bills? Like they end up with professional collectors, right? Um, and then also how much the system is cooperative with, uh, with the existing system is cooperative with what you're doing at MC Squared Health. Yeah, so um, I wanna make sure I understand the question correctly. So the first part is about- I'll, I'll uh, jump in, I'll jump yeah. in. Yeah, yeah you, usually when you go, so, so it's a system, uh, it's, it's a, this is, really fascinating because it's a system that's quite fossilized and I use the example of you go to the hospital for a procedure you you rarely just get a bill what you wind up with is five bills from a vendor that you never heard of and a lab a doctor that you know a doctor you don't know and then you sort of have to navigate the payment process to sort of pay those off and in fairly short order those bills wind up with you know sort of collections yeah. companies you don't actually pay xyz hospital or you don't pay dr smith you wind up paying some collections company in fresno and so given that that's sort of how the system works which is used as about as user unfriendly as you can imagine i'm curious as to how i'll, I'll call it the system responds to your efforts which are sorely needed, I guess I would say. Yeah, I mean, look, we we would go to a health system and, and sell them on three points, um, which are generally received, accepted as desirable. Um, we would tell them, look, we can decrease the amount of time that your staff are spending uh, sending out these bills or picking up the phone and calling patients to try to collect by using a more electronic and modern solution um, we can boost how much you're actually collecting. Um, patients are going to engage better with an electronic solution. Omnichannel payments is far more effective in terms of uh, collecting balances from patients. And we're going to boost the satisfaction of your patients. I mean, this is far less confusing than receiving, you know, a paper statement where you send a, a statement, a patient pays, and then uh, by the time the provider, you know, or the billing office receives the payment and processes it um, and credits it to the account, the patient has already received a second, you know, uh, statement and is wondering why they just got double billed for the same thing. Um, so all very, you know, common challenges. And so we think on those three factors, um, you know, satisfaction, boosting uh, payments, and then decreasing costs uh, for, for billing and, and, you know, getting those bills out there to patients. We think that we're competitive. Now, Hospital systems are always looking for different partners. You know, all clinic sizes, hospital sizes are always looking for different partners to be able to uh, improve these metrics. Um, and, you know, varying collections companies take um, different amounts of, you know, they, they skim off different amounts based on, you know, how far down the collection cycle they right. are. Um, and so if you can provide a competitive rate versus um, what, you know, they might otherwise use, uh, for a collections vendor at that part of the funnel, you can be seen as having a valuable service. So you can compete head to head with the collections group by applying a technology. Um, if you can show the data, you can A-B test basically, a, you know, here's how collections group is doing, give us the other half of the alphabet um, or in a subset of it and let's um, run a trial, let's run a sample and, and we'll show you results. And, you know, then you can make a decision if you want to partner with us or not. So there's a pretty direct um, way to go head to head with a lot of these different collection systems and the collection systems um, that typically exist are, are highly manual as well, right? They're just doing the mm -hmm. same thing that hospital billing patient collections groups are doing, but they usually have some, um, you know, some secret sauce that they're using kind of the back end that's, you know, varies from collections group to collections group that allows them to boost collections. But by and large, they're not leveraging, uh, you know, the full power of technology in 2020 to be able to yeah. um, really bridge that gap between uh, accounts receivable, um, you know, or close the accounts receivable gap, I guess you could say. Yeah. Great answer. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, David. <clears throat> um, 
And then another question, uh, and we'll do the last one uh, talking about MC Squared Health, and we'll move a little bit more on to case and entrepreneurship um, because I know you have an active role with that. So let's talk lastly just about HIPAA compliance. Uh, somebody, uh, Craig was interested about that. So could you talk a little bit more about HIPAA compliance and what MC Squared Health does to secure data? Yeah, so um, HIPAA compliance is the first conversation that we had when we started developing uh, our product. Um, so my background is in psychiatry, uh, psychiatric practice. I was there for about four years. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of assembling that electronic healthcare record system and looking even internally within the UCSF system, how we had to build additional securities for psychiatry kind of like allowed me to understand both the, you know, upper echelon, most secure psychiatric healthcare record practices um, and, and how technologies had to be used and what agreements had to be formed. Um, and then, you know, the more broader, um, less restrictive, but still, you know, you know, still important and secure form of like medical HIPAA security. Um, you know, so I could kind of see both of those. And so that was the mindset I came into this um, venture with. Um, and so what we do is we have, you know, anywhere that we're storing information, uh, we have BAAs, which basically are telling to, you know, our technological, you know, vendors, suppliers, um, if we're storing information with you, this has to be secure. If you can't uh, form a, a BAA, you know, HIPAA secure agreement with us, we can't do business with you. We can't store your data. Um, HIPAA fines are, are hefty. The federal government does, I believe it's $10,000 per violation. Um, and these, these are things that can bankrupt companies very quickly. So we have to take it very seriously, both for the patients and, and the providers that we service. And also take it very seriously for, of course, um, you know, our business's livelihood. I, we can't run a business that is going to be financially at risk of, of going under if we have major HIPAA violation. So we have, you know, BAA agreements. We try to store as much of it as we can. Uh, you know, locally highly secured. Um, none of this information goes into a space uh, or another third party group, um, either without, you know, direct consent of a customer uh, that we're letting them, we're using it for marketing purposes or that we're going to be doing anything with it. Um, and we're just extremely transparent. I mean, if we, if we ever had an issue, which we haven't, um, we would go directly to um, whomever is impacted, let them know what's going on kind of consistent with federal practices about um, how to secure and respond to HIPAA breaches. We haven't had that issue yet. Um, I've seen it happen in practices that I've worked in in the past, but I'm really, um, I'm confident that what we've got in place is very airtight. Um, and we we're always kind of mindful of how we want to um, kind of protect the interests and the, the information for the, the folks that we're working with, both patients and the providers. Thank you. And that's something I'm sure your customers will definitely appreciate. Um, so could we, uh, let's transition the conversation a little bit to talking about, uh, Case Western and, and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so we, as I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but like you are the president of the Bay Area Alumni Association for Case Western. So could you talk a little bit about your role? Um, and this is my favorite, like when we talked earlier, actually, this is my favorite part of our conversation towards the end, but. I really, really enjoyed talking about this because I mean, I'm an optimist. I love talking about future and the future. Um, and this is something that really excites me. So could you talk about your role as the, the, the president of the Alumni Association there and uh, what you hope for the future for Case Western students uh, as well as the Alumni Association? Yeah, of course, happy to. Um, first of all, a wonderful chapter. Um, amazing, you know, members, amazing region some really unique traits, characteristics, uh, being out here in the Bay Area, um, and wonderful team that I've got around me. So I, I work really closely um, with uh, Tiana Ellington um, and Rachel Stone. And they're, Tiana's on the university side uh, with the Alumni Association, and Rachel uh, works at Salesforce, and she's VP, and her and I work in tandem to, to get a lot of this uh, stuff done that we're moving for the Bay Area. Um, it's a great opportunity um, to kind of using the, uh, the Bay Area chapter is a great opportunity to be able to bridge kind of case Western talent interest, um, particularly like in the spaces of um, I've noticed engineering and health are two major focus areas. And so that's kind of the intersection for what I'm involved with the NC squared health too. So it's natural to want to like 
pull some of the talent over to the Bay Area, have them work on different projects, um, or in, you know, be involved in different ways uh, with different folks and things that are happening in the Bay Area. Um, a lot of opportunities to stimulate conversations about interesting startup ideas, uh, to connect and create networking opportunities for people who are interested in furthering, uh, enhancing their career opportunities. Um, and so it's really great to be able to be kind of in this um, function where I can kind of connect people and match make of sorts. Um, and so what we've been doing, um, you know, very recently in the past year, as we're kind of really getting our sea legs in a sense, is that we've been putting together strategic plans that have been really um, kind of informed, instructed by what our members are looking for in our chapter. We had a couple of events, great turnout, fully sold out. And then we had some surveys that we basically put out to a lot of those event attendees and got some really meaningful ideas about, um, you know, what we can do to keep kind of the momentum going forward. Um, and what do our chapter members want? And, and we're really now focusing on kind of using this uh, chapter space as an ability to create professional networks and opportunities to bridge talent, um, to be able to talk and meaningfully and, uh, learn, engage professionally, kind of like an ongoing educational format, um, even after graduating from college. Because a lot of the, we've, we're finding that a lot of the uh, membership is interested in continuing to advance their career and they, they associate Case Western um, as an amazing place to learn. Um, and they then see the alumni association's efforts and the chapter efforts as an extension of that, which is, you know, how do we continue to learn um, and move forward on that uh, amazing education that we got over our case. So really trying to um, kind of bring that all together in one place, which has been a lot of fun. Hey, Ashley, this is uh, Todd stepping in real quick. Um, that resonates, obviously, a ton with what we're doing here in the Veal Institute. Um, one thing that's kind of an acute need right now is uh, a lot of students, because of COVID-19, have actually lost internships. Um, a lot of companies are just either pairing back or, uh, you know, canning their entire internship program for the summer. So we're trying to connect folks here with opportunities. And to the extent that you have or anybody else on the, on the call here has some ideas, uh, in terms of getting our students engaged, it's a bit of a strange year in that respect. Um, and then secondarily, we're also thinking about some of the secondary education stuff, particularly around specifically this entrepreneurship topic, um, providing some of the great um, you know, content that we have here to alumni. I mean, they're just as interested in our students and probably more so in a lot of cases. So we'd love to work with you on that. I know we're working with the broader alumni association as well, but uh, just a couple things to put a bug in your ear. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think there's a, a bunch of things in there that we should have a uh, phone call and definitely unpack. That, that's, I think, sorely needed exactly the, the way in which we're thinking about it too. And I think most importantly, the, the way in which um, different alumni chapter members are looking to be engaged. I mean, pe people are looking for this. Um, and so I think that we have a real obligation duty to be able to provide it to them. And especially now with what's happening with COVID, finding the right ways to plug these things together. Um, I think is really opportune and will provide some really great um, results for, you know, alumni um, and, you know, results for the university. Great. Well, thanks for all of your hard work on the West Coast. I appreciate it. And for all of your help and for joining today. This was fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I'll just finish up with saying, you know, actually, like, that's something as a student, and I know plenty of my students at Case Western as well, classmates would definitely appreciate you know i think there is a gap right now between alumni and students and you know there's a willingness on both sides but there's just miscommunication and that's a lot of i think what todd doug and michael the veal institute want to do and are doing a great job of already so um hopefully we continue forward with that great prog progress so thank you so much ashley for joining me today and i'm gonna um throw it back to doug thank you everyone so much for attending today uh great conversation with ashi and max um, just to wrap things up quickly, uh, we do have another talk this Friday at 12 o'clock. Uh, Michael's leading as part of the Beyond Silicon Valley, focusing on access to capital. And we'll have Todd Fetterman from North Coast Ventures, and then Alexander Lazaro from Cath Cathay Innovation. Uh, and then we have next week featuring uh, Arnold Huffman, who's also a case alum founder and CEO of Digital Yalo, and that conversation will be facilitated by Melissa Heath. So a lot of great more speakers coming through the month of May. Please feel free to join us and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much.